Are we? OK. All right. So uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, Lessons Learned Running Open Infrastructure on Bare Metal Kubernetes Clusters in Production. Uh, my name is Alan Meadows. I'm one of the lead architects for AT&T's Network Cloud, and I also work in the OpenStack Helm and Airship communities. And I'm Pete Burley, and I work on OpenStack Helm and some other things within AT&T. <clears throat> so, this presentation is going to be a, it's going to be a technical presentation where there's not any a real uh, stringent ordering to sort of what we're going to cover. There's basically two sections. We're going to talk about some some Docker experiences and some Kubernetes experiences. Um, we're just going to kind of go through them one by one. So before we begin, we have to you know we're going to talk a, a lot about some some negative experiences with Docker and Kubernetes, but we want to sort of start out in preferences that we love Docker and we love Kubernetes. Um, it's transformed the way that we deliver software. Uh, it's effectively, containers has become the new unit of software delivery for us, and that's, that's been great. We have no plans to change our course and do anything different. Um, you know, despite some of these challenges that we faced, uh, it's still the right path. And really, the, the core message I think we want people to leave with is that Docker and Kubernetes are usually doing things that make a lot of sense, especially as they release new versions and bring new features. It's just sometimes those things don't make sense for us, especially people who are trying to run these workloads, or run workloads that are uh, open infrastructure based, you know, low level things like, you know, running open vSwitch, libvirt, things like that inside of Kubernetes. I, I think it's fair to say that we are pretty atypical users of this sort of stuff. And, That's right. And often go counter to, to what a lot of the recommendations about running sort of pets and stateful workloads. Yep, and so uh, hopefully you guys will, uh, you know, um, hope you find some of our challenges interesting and um, maybe even helpful to the stuff you're doing. So, Docker. Oh, should we? Okay. So we, we sort of have, have had quite a lot of experience over the last two years of, of running sort of infrastructure that lags quite, quite a long way behind um, the current versions upstream, partly because we want to build up a, a big understanding of, of how these individual things act, act with each other. Um, Although, what was it, sort of the end of last year, we found that we were starting to experience some issues with uh, Docker 113 startup in some of our sites, where we were seeing some uh, state being corrupted as uh, Docker itself started to get out of, out of sync with container D. And, um, you know, so we ended up in a situation where we were having to perform far too many manual operations, cleaning, cleaning up sites, letting us recover things. And um, we, we were unable to restart Docker to sort of do minor configuration changes without heavily impacting our, our workloads, which, which kind of pushed us to wanting to, to upgrade. <laughs> Sorry, I think these were out of order a little bit. So, uh, so a lot of these challenges with 1.13, they caused us to, you know, the, the the next upgrade that we did after that was to Docker 17 CE, um, and that was on Kubernetes 1.11.6. Uh, and you know, the upgrade was actually pretty trivial. So uh, we were a little worried that it might be a little bit more complex, but effectively a, an upgrade upgrade was all that it took, and it went rather smoothly, and we didn't even really interrupt our workloads. However, um, about a day after we did the upgrade, um, the host began melting down, um, they started spiraling uh, with load spikes, and we had to reboot them in order to stabilize them. So an upgrade that appeared to be something that was straightforward uh, turned out not to be. And effectively, I mean, our, our message, our takeaway from this is, is really Docker upgrades in production are not as easy as we might first think. Uh, they don't necessarily behave the same way in production as they do in labs, and really, uh, our, our philosophy is that these sorts of, we believe these upgrades should be predictable, but they're not. And so really the way that we will achieve these going forward is 
reprovisioning machines with the target versions. And I think that, that predictability becomes really hard for us when you start running things that, that sort of interact quite heavily with the kernel and other, other bits of infrastructure, whether that's open vSwitch or libvirt, and the control, the sort of surface area there becomes much larger than it, than it typically is. Ooh. Okay. So, as we as we touched on there, this is one of one of the things that really started to um, affect affect us was the trying to keep Containerd and the Docker API in sync on, on bits of infrastructure that have been running for for a long time, and we started to sort of see container corruption being fairly widespread in some sites that have been up for about a year or so, um, and then. This sort of manifested itself in uh, the, the pod lifecycle event generator or, or, the, or the P leg um, that you started to see uh, coming out of the kublet where we would um, see a huge load appearing, appearing on our machines um, as, as the kublet continuously tried to pull uh, the Docker API and essentially sort of beat it into, into a corner quite often. Mm -hmm. um, and, and through this, we sort of Kubernetes itself is is not very great at uh, detecting a sick Docker and, and backing off. You know, it, it really is rather relentless in the way that it will will um, hit those things. And so, not only is it not good at uh, detecting that, it's really bad at coping with it. So when when you start to see these sorts of issues, you get node flapping and all sorts of other things, which sort of mean that you get a lot of churn in the cluster. We try and try and avoid. And I think one of the, the lessons we get from this is that projects like the node problem detector, I think we view as being really critical long, long term in order to running, running things in a reliable and, uh, manner. Mm -hmm. And so typically, you know, most, most issues that we saw, we typically got around by um, re restarting Docker. And then failing that, rebooting the host, apart from a few sort of occasions when we ended up in a scenario where we had to really get very engaged because there was no appetite for disrupting other workloads that were, were running on those machines. And so it's, it's because of that um, that although we think Docker is a, a really great tool for development, building images, and um, you know, what, what it offers there is, is second to none, when you're actually running serious workloads, directly talking to Container D or, it's, uh, or, or Cryo is probably uh, a more shrewd choice, simply because it removes the, the Docker API from, from there. Yeah. So we're going to move into the Kubernetes section. So the first, first sort of issue we want to talk about is a config map mount mystery, and I mean the uh, I, I, again, I think the, the, the core message here is that you know, transient errors in a system like Kubernetes where they can automatically self-heal are okay, but persistent errors are a menace. It either means humans need to get involved or we need to write software in order to find these things um, and, and take some action to move them forward. So one of the things that we saw in Kubernetes 1.10 was you know, we, we do a lot of volume mounts um, in, inside of containers. Uh, you know, the, the OpenStack Helm projects and other things leverage these uh, pretty, uh, pretty voluminously in order to mount in scripts and other things like that. Um, and occasionally, we would see containers that, uh, <clears throat> that, that would fail to be able to find uh, scripts that, that effectively had been mounted into them. And there was really no way to, to resolve that issue other than literally terminating the pod, allowing the sandbox to respawn. Uh, otherwise, it would be perpetually stuck in this state. Kubernetes would never be able to automatically fix this issue. Okay. And, and we, we saw these sorts of uh, persistent volume uh, claim issues, because we, we view a config map as essentially being a, a persistent volume when, when mounted uh, into a container with a few, with a few other things. Um, I think one of the, the things that we found most scary when, when, we, when we encountered it was uh, we, we use uh, PVCs to back, Ceph, uh, to back MariaDB databases, RabbitMQ, Postgre, and a whole host of other things. And the way Kubernetes manages these devices is it uh, provisions it. The kubelet makes an attempt to mount it. If the kubelet can't mount it, it'll uh, make the assumption that you're dealing with a fresh volume and uh, create a brand new file system ready for use. 
and uh, this is this is pretty great most of the time and um, kind of kind of terrifying because uh, you sometimes end up in a situation where for whatever reason if a host has gone down hard and you've got some fairly minor file system corruption uh, the kubelet can go around rather rather happily uh, re reformatting devices which uh, Kind of, kind of made us pretty th happy to have both backups and, and high availability databases. Um, and so we found sort of a, a rather sort of un unpleasant way around this, we've, which we've now imported and codified as a mop within, within the platform, where we can scale, scale down workloads, um, make, make sure that uh, we're not going to uh, sort of get, get that workload attempted to be mounted anywhere. We take our Ceph uh, configuration files, load those onto the host, manually uh, map the uh, RBD uh, volume onto the host, run uh, an FS check on it, and then at that stage we can, we can unmap the device, free it up, and then get, it, get our workloads back up and running. Another Another issue we sort of ran into, especially in the, the early days of, of OpenStack Helm, was, um, you know, uh, there was a lot of... The ephemeral cloud. <laughs> tr truly, truly an ephemeral cloud in the sense that uh, a lot of, initially a lot of the, a lot of the neutron agents uh, effectively had private namespaces within their pods. So this would do a, this would do a couple of, of different things. One is the network namespaces that OpenStack would create were created within the pods. So those namespaces would stay private to those pods. So when you're, when you're doing something like investigating uh, a, a network issue, you know, an operator would end up having to exec into dozens of pods you know, on that particular host to troubleshoot standard neutron flows. You know, can I, can I ping the router gateway? Can I ping between the high availability networks? It became a brand new workflow that they had to do, and it was, it was, it was troublesome and extremely complex. And also, I mean, probably the, the worst thing is that when the pods recycle due to rolling updates, and this, is, this could be, you know, as simple as, as something as uh, changing a configuration item for those neutron services or releasing a new image, it resulted in an actual impact to OVS because the pods would be torn down, all the network namespaces that were created inside of them for OpenStack would be torn down too, and this was causing a big problem. So one of the things that we did was leverage bidirectional mount propagation. So we can actually take the host network namespace and allow that to be visible from the pod and vice versa. So effectively, all the network namespace operations that the pods were doing would be visible, phys visible on the physical node. And this also allowed people to sort of jump back to doing what they were doing in the past in order to troubleshoot neutrons. So you know, all of the DHCP namespaces, all of the neutron router namespaces, they would all be there in one place on one physical node. They could hop between them pretty easily. And, and I think this is sort of quite a good example about where, as, as we've been going along this journey, Kubernetes has been either moving too fast for us or not quite fast enough. And then it was, what, 110 that we were able, able to start doing this, although, one, one trade-off is you can only use uh, bidirectional mount propagation with privileged containers. So as well as providing an easy fix for, for one thing, it then meant that we had to go through and lock down um, our pods much more aggressively than we had previously and um, what permissions we gave them. So other, other challenges that we've had is, is process reaping. So you know, container processes, they need to run as a child process of either the pause container or uh, use the host init system. I mean, if you're, if you're running something earlier than Kubernetes 1.10. So if you're not doing that, then these defunct processes will sprawl, uh, they'll never be reaped, and uh, you know, effectively your, your host at some point will, will melt down. I mean, these are, these are exacerbated, especially if these things are incorporated into cron jobs and other things that are periodically running, or if you're just doing a whole lot of releases and, and churning um, um, con containers, you, you, can, you can get this as well. So you, you can do things like run into the pit max limit on your host, or the host just might fall over because it's run out of resources. And I think, I think sort of some non clementia that we've started to use internally is sort of the, the series of geddons that have occurred. And I think, I think this was one of the, the early ones where we had some health checks that were leaving zombies around, and after 
what was it, three or four days of them being introduced, we started to see workloads dropping. Yeah, and the right. process of trying to make things better with stricter additional liveness probes, we ended up doing the reverse and, and hurting the system um, yeah. with, with this. I, I think an interesting thing, to, though, to point out is that you know, this, this behavior is exactly what you want for most things running. However, sometimes it's not what you want. So we don't want reaping to occur when we're doing things like running libvird as a pod. Um, you know, those things we want to be able to, you know, escape the reaping process because when you cycle the libvird pod, you don't want that to tear down all of the quimu processes that has spawned. And we want to be able to do things like make small changes to libvird potentially release new versions and things like that, and have that behave exactly as though you were doing it on a bare metal system. So I think we sort of split, splitting this out in, in general for, for process reaping, we found uh, you know, for, for things like our, our neutron uh, pods and other things, setting, setting a share process namespace to true is the easiest way to fix that. Most container runtimes do this by default with the, the exception of Docker. And then other, other things that you could do as a, as a short-term measure that we had was run things as child processes, a bash within a container that allowed us to reap processes, but then because bash isn't an init, uh, init system, signal propagation and uh, passing down couldn't be relied on. So it, it, it has some crudities. Um, oh, this thing. <laughs> Um, There's a lot of PTSD with a lot of these issues, so I apologize. Uh, I, I told Alan this morning that I might just be on stage crying. Um, this, this was a fun weekend. Um, so, uh, shall, we, shall we set the stage here? In yeah, the, think, in the yeah. sense that, so uh, with, with libvirt, we, we use uh, in, within at and and by default for OpenStack Helm, uh, Ceph for uh, Cinder volumes, um, and so when when libvirt starts up, it spawns a QEMU process which uh, opens a uh, uh, opens the, the, the libvirt sorry the ceph.conf and hold, holds that uh, open via a file ha file handle, and so this was creating problems for us when we tried to restart the, the libvirt pods, and um, they were essentially getting wedged. We uh, Kind of went down a bit of a, a rabbit hole here, where me and one of my colleagues were looking looking at bugs that had been affecting sort of Mesosphere about three or four years ago with similar things, and then eventually sort of just ended up with a, the rather crude and pragmatic approach of mounting these into the file system, copying the appropriate uh, files over to the same location on the host file system as they were in the container, and just sort of allowed us to to skirt around the issue. And I think, I think this, is a, this is another great example of, of that sort of thing that we set out to, to talk about, which is, you know, this is, this is a, a sort of weird Band-Aid-like approach, but it's effectively because our use case is strange for, for standard Kubernetes uses. And so, you know, we, we, have these, we have these processes that are holding open these file handles. We don't want, the, we, we don't, we don't want those to be terminated when we're terminating well, we, we, the parent We pod. want to be able to remove the containers and the pods, yes. but, but leave the processes behind, yeah. which uh, is, is pretty odd. <laughs> and this, this, this leads us into how Kubernetes tried to close the door on this. Yeah, yes. So, C group funds. So, um, so this is an issue we had with, uh, uh, I forget the Kubernetes version, but uh, uh, running on kernel 4.15, system D229. A dangling C group was created whenever a pod with a volume referencing a secret is present in the pod spec. Uh, so it doesn't have to be mounted anywhere. So you know these volume mounts doesn't actually even need to be present in the pod spec. And cron jobs really accentuated this problem because effectively they create a whole lot of churn. And you know, what are the ramifications of this? So this would effectively leak C groups. They would end up causing huge CPU spikes in memory load for the kubelet, especially when it's scraped periodically. Um, and, and this is because uh, you know, when, when we're doing these scrapings, we're effectively walking all of the C groups that include you know, CPU and memory usage for every C group on the system. Um, and this is another one of those examples where it takes time for this problem to fully manifest itself. So in investigating this issue, you know, hopefully it'd be easy to figure out what's going on here and what's causing these leaks. 
And really, uh, the answer is it wasn't easy to figure out. Um, I mean, you know, various combinations, this would happen. Um, so it wasn't exactly uh, the version of system D, it wasn't exactly the kernel, it was the combination of the two that end up causing this problem, which is why this is really hard to uh, arrive at what exactly was the, was the root cause. Uh, this is just sort of an example up on the screen of, you know, sometimes you find these issues and whether it's, you know, it's necessary to upgrade the kernel or upgrade system D, these are not always easy to, you know, effectively put into practice immediately to solve the problem. So we end up with a lot of these sort of, you know, temporary things recurringly running in the system to help clean these things up until we can move forward with the version of the kernel or forward with the version of system D. Okay. So um, I think one, one, one other thing that we, we found was sort of propagated by, by two things, but in general sort of actually trying to upgrade Kubernetes from one release to another without, without impacting the workloads was um, sometimes pretty challenging because we would encounter changes um, in, in the way that Kubernetes manage things. And this, this is especially relevant sort of when we're trying to run our, our VNF workloads where we, we're in an environment where we can't drop a single packet while simultaneously dealing with huge pages, CPU pinnings, and other things that the kubelet hasn't, hasn't sort of, isn't going to expect and isn't being gated for in uh, Kubernetes releases. So things that are breaking for us, you know, pretty, pretty much only breaking for us. And so we, we sort of had to really implement some really rigorous testing when, when upgrading from one Kubernetes version to another, including sort of some, some fairly rudimentary regression testing. Um, and, and the other thing that we would quite often find is if you upgraded the kubelet, it would leave existing pods alone. And then on either restarting the kubelet, Docker, or even the host, we would find things don't come back quite as we would expect in the same way. Um, so that, that was something we had to, had to deal with quite a few, few, few times. And sort of looking, looking at an example of this, um, around about, we, we jumped from what, Kubernetes 1.8 to 1.10. Mm -hmm. um, and at some, some point, um, it's coming in initially with 1.9 1 and then getting more developed with 1.10, uh, Kubernetes started to manage and uh, deal with uh, C, C groups, uh, sorry, huge page C groups, uh, as, as part of the preparation for the, the preliminary support that came in in 1.11. And so, this broke libvirt uh, for us um, in, in terms of allowing Nova VMs to uh, successfully allocate huge pages. And suddenly all, all the processes, uh, libvirt D and then its, its children, uh, Quemu, um, were, were being denied uh, through C, C group permissions there. Uh, it also broke us being able to uh, survive uh, restarts um, because Kubernetes uh, started uh, being much more aggressive in the way that it would tear down C groups. Um, and so it would also take all the child processes that were underneath it. And this is an example of something where if you're running a, a pod in the host's PID namespace that's uh, forking things, typically that's exactly what you would want, but it, it really came to hurt us. Um, and so, so in the short term, um, to sort of tackle the first problem, we, we started editing um, C groups uh, as part of our startup script um, in, within the pod, which allowed us um, to actually adjust adjust the values as we as we'd expect in order to in order to allow us to boot VMs again. And then longer longer term, we sort of I, 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 I'm kind of embarrassed with this on screen. Um, we we took a, an approach that's much more aggressive and sort of broke um, completely out of uh, the Kubernetes defined C groups that were created uh, by the Kubelet for for processes. So we created our own uh, for for CPU, RMA, um, and huge pages. Uh, we then then created created that C group and then. Within, within the pod, instead of launching libvirtsd uh, directly, we would uh, firstly uh, CG exec into that new set of C groups we created and use systemd run to start things as a transient unit on the host. Um, and this 
allowed us to get the same sort of operation that we'd seen with our 1.8 1 back, where we could both run huge page enabled VMs really easily, and we could also restart our pods at will without impacting those workloads. So uh, another, another issue that we experienced is, is time stealing and, and also negotiating CPU pinning with Kubernetes. So our, our compute nodes are Kubernetes nodes themselves. Things like the Nova Compute Agent, Libvirt, all of those things, you know, as we, as we sort of covered, are, are containerized on those hosts. And um, those, those nodes running you know, VNF uh, Nova workloads are actually members of the Kubernetes cluster. So this is, again, one of those, another one of those examples where probably Kubernetes doesn't expect you to have you know, this, this, other, this other resource running on there, something like Nova attempting to do CPU pinning. Um, and we run VNF workloads, and they expect to have dedicated access to cores. Um, obviously, when that doesn't happen, performance suffers. And this is actually really bad when you're doing things like voice or other things. And our tenants, um, testing tenants started to report that you know, mysterious drops in, in call tests and other things like this. And we started to investigate what was going on. Um, so by default, you know, the, the Kubernetes workloads are scheduled on any core, even if those workloads are, um, are a member of ISIL CPUs, which is a standard way that people are protecting certain CPUs for um, you know, uh, 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 VM workloads. And so on Nova Compute nodes, which, which are also Kubernetes, we needed a way to restrict Kubernetes from using ISIL CPUs. So you know, we're given, a, given an ISIL CPU set that looks something like what's up on the screen, we needed to come up with a way to launch the kubelet with a custom C group that would effectively allow us to provide it a limitation because this, this functionality at this time wasn't something that was baked in. So the approach that we took was creating a new custom C group that held the inverse of ISIL CPUs, so effectively telling the kubelet that it could use the opposite CPUs of what we were trying to dedicate to VNF workloads. We needed to build a new system D unit that launched this C group creation um, prior to the kubelet launching up. And then finally, we needed to create the actual script that you know, set up that new kube whitelist C group um, and pass that as a new parameter into the kubelet. We don't, we don't have an example of that script, do we? No, we don't have that, that script. If anyone is curious, we can certainly share it. I think it's got some pretty impressive use of set. <laughs> I think said is called uh, three or four times in that script together in a daunting chain. So uh, another, another issue that you know, uh, uh, plagued us a little bit was, was slow, uh, slow state change propagation inside Kubernetes. So we leverage init containers quite heavily. Those init containers do all kinds of things for us. Um, one of the things that they do that's really important is dependency checking. So it allows us to kind of roll things out in an ordered fashion without needing to have some master orchestrators kind of you know, doing them in any special order. We can just kind of throw them at the wall, let Kubernetes sort them out. But we can also treat crash loops as something to pay attention to rather than something that just occurs naturally. And so what we started to notice is that dependency checking would start to uh, take longer and longer and longer. Um, so even though we'd see resources like uh, you know, a job, Nova DB init had already been done for 10, 10 or 15 minutes. We would look in one of the other init containers for something that was depending upon that, and it was still sitting there waiting for that to complete. So there's a disconnect going some, on. Some, something we also saw here, um, which we spent probably longer than we should have scratching our heads over, was you would start to see different responses from, from different things, <laughs> where you would see a kube control describe on a, on a pod, Mm -hmm. would show the container having started, having exited. But then if you ran kube control get, it would show it's still impending. So, that, so you, would, you would see, depending on where you queried, very, very different messages being fed back. So you know, one of the reasons that we believe this is, this is occurring is that we, you know, we, we double the, the number of pods per node. We, we run pretty highly stacked nodes. Um, but I, at the end of the day, I don't think we really doubled all that we needed to. Um, and so one of the things that we had to do that greatly relieved this problem is changing the kube API burst parameters and the kube API QPS parameters. And that really allowed Kubernetes to actually keep up much better with all the state changes that were occurring and remove this, this issue from occurring. 
Okay. Oh, this. <laughs> um, when, when, when was this? It was, it, was, it was the first of June or July, I, I, I think. It was definitely the first of a month. It was a rainy day. It was, it was bleak. Yeah. <laughs> um, it started so well. Uh, and, then, and then this happened. Um, so we, we have you know, sev several cron jobs within, within our system for, that, that should do sort of routine maintenance tasks, whether that's sort of checking, checking OSDs, removing dead heat engines. And um, we, we discovered this sort of ra rather, rather nice quirk, um, which, which, which you know, is pretty, pretty scary when it happens, which is if you create a, a cron job uh, with, a, with a container that's explicitly calling some path that doesn't exist. Um, Docker fr uh, freaks out, um, and so you start getting OCI runtime errors coming back, and and Kubernetes does does its thing, um, where it'll then have another have another shot, and within a couple of minutes you start to see this sort of thing build building up from that previous manifest, and then within a couple of hours. You start to see nodes become very unresponsive, and then about ten minutes after that, phones start ringing, um, and and so this this is kind of an area where it's pr it's pretty hard for us to come up with a clean solution other than sort of emphasizing the value of testing everything prior prior to putting it out there, because. In, in, in many ways, you know, this is, this is a perfectly valid description for a job. And without knowledge of the image, there's no way that you could write a sort of admission controller to catch this sort of thing. And so, and so you're, you're, you're left in a scenario where there's, there's things that can sort of creep out that can have some really <coughs> catastrophic and un, unintentional um, consequences. I think it was a sort of quite a very hurried bit of kube control delete that, that intervened there. So another, another lesson that we learned is that Kubernetes services are not load balancers. So, I mean, many people might already be familiar with the sort of thing that they provide, but a Kubernetes service, it really provides a really convenient and powerful way to retrieve a list of pods that are sitting, sitting behind some service. It's very tempting to use this to actually distribute all the incoming requests to a particular, to a particular workload or a service. And under the hood, what's being used is IP tables to help you know, distribute that traffic among all the backend pods that are ready to receive that traffic. And then, the, then a node goes down. And, and then a node goes down, uh, or a network partition occurs, or any other number of things. And the problem is, IP tables is not really that intelligent. It displays this traffic over all of those endpoints. Some of those endpoints can be dead, and what you end up with is requests to Kubernetes services that can just go into a black hole. So d just briefly to sort of set up here is how, how does this work? That looks a little weird. There we go. So, um, you know, like we said, you get a Kubernetes service. It gets some magical, mythical IP that's effectively a series of IP tables rules on the host. And those map um, to addresses that end up getting uh, Dean added to real pod IPs uh, that are actually containing the workloads in some sort of probabilistic um, manner. So you know, a, a lot of things go into whether a pod is in that list of endpoints. So is the node is the node online? Um, you know, has has the controller manager detected a down node? Lots of complex timers involved in sort of detecting whether those pods are online or offline. Is the pod in a ready state? Um, and 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 effectively, it's not it's not a foolproof system, and it doesn't react immediately in real time. And, and why why does this matter to us? <laughs> So this, this matters because I think we need to look at you know, what a typical OpenStack service request looks like. So, I mean, when, when you do something like sort of even, even something very simple like listing heat stacks, mm -hmm. this, is, this is what occurs. Um, this is a simplified version, but where, it's something like this. Where you, where, where you first request a, a Keystone token, it goes and talks to MariahDB, it emits an event to RabbitMQ for CADF notifications, it, it hits memcache. Mm -hmm. Then you get that token back. It then goes back to uh, an API service, which does a very, very similar set of things. It tries to talk to Heat Engine via RabbitMQ, and eventually, th through this sort of 
Byzantine labyrinth, you get, you get your response back. And, and it only takes one bad, bad actor within this chain, and, and you start seeing failed responses. So as we're saying, sort of as these interdependencies grow, so does the likelihood that a single node failure or a network partition or anything like that will interrupt part of this flow. And, and the most important thing is that from the outside observer, the, the person doing you know, a heat stack list, the request failed. They don't care that we, we did 90% of this. If we can't get to the last mile, it doesn't really matter. And it's pretty, pretty hard for, for you to debug because when you first go into a cluster and have a look at it, everything looks okay. Um, and you, you end up at that stage of really having to dig much deeper than you'd like to see what's going wrong. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, so what's, what's the solution to this? I think, I think from our perspective, you know, Kubernetes services are, are really useful for looking up available endpoints. And you shouldn't really be using uh, cluster IPs, at least with IP tables. Um, for services that cannot tolerate drops requests. Um, we're starting to explore using things like uh, ingress controllers, uh, either, either Nginx or HA proxy, with templates uh, enhanced to, to actually do valid checking and timeouts and retries. So if we do start to see failures within our infrastructure, we might see some sort of slightly slower responses, but they at least will always eventually succeed. So one of the other lessons is that uh, self-hosting log management is hard. Um, you know, the, the CNF recommends Fluentd, which is, which is great, but if you're actually building Kubernetes clusters um, and you have logs that are important at the time that you're building the cluster, your logging frameworks might not actually be up at the time you're building those clusters. Um, and also, how do you monitor the bootstrapping of new Kubernetes clusters when your logging and monitoring platform might not be in place yet? Uh, you know, you sort of get vicious cycles of the log management system, you know, FluentD, Elasticsearch, um, you know, the, they can introduce enough load themselves to actually hurt the cluster. Um, and, and finally, um, really, you know, a consistent challenge is that OpenStack, you know, really does not ha handle its logging system disappearing on it very well. And so you end up potentially with a tight coupling between something like OpenStack and FluentD if you choose to. Uh, go down the path of that integration, um, and that just, you end up with one more dependency and one more thing that can fail, um, that can hurt your OpenStack services. I think it's, it's partly because of that we're, we're considering sort of going to more primitive approaches. Yeah. Okay. So this, I think, I think Alan can probably talk better about this, this example than I can, but I think, I think it really exemplifies why um, Kubernetes is hard in, in the sense that there are, there are a lot of moving parts, probably a lot less moving parts than some other traditional infrastructure management like OpenStack, but um, you, you, might, you might sort of feel that you've reached a, a level of security or other things and then, and then suddenly later on discover that there's a back door. Wide yeah, open. and this might be an issue that many people are familiar with. The CVE was created for this a while back, but it, it's also just one of those things where it was open for quite some time and it is just a, a configuration parameter that you need to be configuring your kubelets with, but most people weren't configuring it that way because that wasn't the default. And so this is, this is an example of, of, of effectively being able to run privileged commands with a simple REST request. I mean, in, in, the, in the black boxes that we have here, we have in some total described to you how to talk to the kubelet and run a command on root as root on the host, and that's quite a big deal. Um, and so uh, I think it just sort of speaks to Kubernetes has you know, a simplistic number of components, but it's, it's still hard. Yeah, at the end of and, the and it's, it's really easy to miss things like turning off anonymous auth because, <laughs> yes. because when, when the default is false, you, you tend, to, tend to move on. And I think, you know, it, from my perspective, this is why it became a CVE in a sense. Okay. So with uh, 50 seconds, any questions? I think there's a microphone. Hi, that was a really good talk. Um, just a quick question. When you talk about um, corrupted Docker, you're talking about containers running on your production workload that have 
corrupted, that have become corrupted. Is that correct? Yeah, or, or various state files for Docker on the file system of the host have become have okay. corrupted. Okay. So, can you talk about some of the range of behaviours that you've seen of a corrupted Docker instance or container running that mean it didn't fail the health check and sort of the tools that Kubernetes gives you to validate that it's okay? I think, thankfully, I, I can't think of an instance where we've actually seen that. We've seen many varied reasons for an inability to run a workload, but I am unaware of a time when we've seen workloads running but not running as they should. Yeah, most, most of them are startup failures, and, and as we mentioned, we don't really care about the individual containers themselves, so it's just a matter of actually literally purging them and letting them be reinstantiated from ground zero. Thanks. Mm -hmm. If, if this question's hard, we can just say we're out of time. Yes. Let's hear it first. <laughs> this work, after all this work, um, do you think it's really worth to run OpenStack control plane on Kubernetes? Because OpenStack control plane was never designed to be cloud native. Yes. Yes. Without, a, without, without question. I, I think a lot of the... A lot of the challenges we faced have not been unique. I mean, we, we've described some of the unique things to Kubernetes here, but in general, it forces you to build a very resilient deployment um, and deal with the same problems that you should be doing if you're, if you're deploying via Ansible or managing via Puppet. It, it puts those things right up front and center. And then the other advantages you get through sort of the ability to perform reconfiguration, check the state of, of things, really, really pays off. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I think that's the get off sign. Okay. <laughs> thank you.